Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, delighted to have uh, Brian McVeigh here to continue our journey into core ideas of Julian Chains. So Brian is writing a book on self-healing, the self-healing mind. And this is the second uh, meetup on the self-healing mind. So Brian, Last time we talked about conscious interiority as the core concept. So could you describe conscious interiority very briefly in the next uh, three, four minutes, and then we can go to the next topic. Go ahead. Oh, just a second. There is a problem. Give me a second. Okay, go ahead now. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, I think what I'll do um, is I'll just describe very briefly several features of conscious or I prefer conscious interiority. And as we know, at first, it's, it's a little bit um, counterintuitive. It's a little bit uh, difficult to deal with because in our mind, we already have all these assumptions about what consciousness is. So it's very important to keep in mind that we're talking about a specific type of cognition described by Julian Jaynes. So the first uh, feature of consciousness is that it is culturally learned. And I think that's really the most important contribution that Jane's made in our understanding of consciousness. Consciousness is not something that is genetic. It's not something that's built in uh, to the human organism. Just like mathematics, consciousness is a type of knowledge that has to be learned. And it's learned through language. Uh, specifically metaphors. And these metaphors can be very powerful because they convince us that we have a, a, a mental space inside our head. Actually, in ancient times, this space was in uh, internal organs, not necessarily in the head. That's a very modern, almost a Western way, perhaps, of viewing consciousness, something in the head. But in any case, it shows you the cultural variability associated with uh, consciousness. Uh, another important aspect of consciousness is that it, because it hollows out this imaginary space in our head, it allows us to simulate the natural and social environment. It allows us to take shortcuts. It allows us to act things out in our minds without actually doing them. Things that might ordinarily be very risky or expensive. Uh, so consciousness really is an adaptation. It's something that did not naturally evolve in terms of biology, but historically or culturally evolved based on language as societies became more complex. You know, we've covered that, uh, uh, that, that ground, of course, in previous sessions, but uh, just to uh, emphasize uh, the consciousness is only about 3,000 years old. In other words, there's no evidence in the in ancient text of what we would call subjective, introspectable self-awareness. The other, the, the final point I want to make about uh, what conscious interiority is, is that it's actually a package of mental abilities. And we talked about this last time. There's about, about a dozen or so of these capabilities. And if you really want to understand what James is talking about or what I'm talking about, you have to look at consciousness as a list of these key features. And that way things become more concrete. I mean, that's a problem with the word consciousness. It's a little bit vague. People don't know what it means. Um, we, we use it interchangeably. It has four or five basic meanings in the English language. But in order to understand and appreciate what how it's being used uh, within this setting, of course, uh, my advice is to look at those or review those uh, dozen or so uh, key features of, uh, of consciousness. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that's, that would sort of Perfect. be my uh, three minute uh, explanation of what consciousness is. Perfect. And uh, folks, I've posted uh, in chat our Julian Jaynes playlist We've done a number of videos uh, on this, number of meetups on this, which are all posted there. Uh, I would like to know how many of you have attended at least one or watched video of at least one of the 
uh, of our Julian Chains uh, meetups. So that way I can, we can tailor the presentation to that. So you can, if you're watched, just say yes. Or uh, if you have not watched uh, or attended, you can say no. Even if you attended just one, you can say yes, because we're trying to communicate ideas of Julian Chains, which is which are very fundamental ideas. So this is great, um, Brian. It's a very large number of people have have watched many, and Madeline has watched all of them. So that's that's great. I attended all of them. All right. So today we are going to talk about uh, hallucinations, um, hypnosis, and meditation. In what order would you like to talk about them? Um, I suppose we could start with uh, hallucinations. Sure. Go ahead. So what are halluc hallucinations? So hallucinations is the belief that you are having a sensory experience of something that is not there which, by the way, is not the same thing as a perceptual illusion or a, some sort of visual trick uh, that, if, that uh, you know, if you recall from taking a course in psychology, there are many ways to fool the eye. Um, that's not what a, a hallucination is. And a hallucination is when you believe, for example, that there's a person standing behind me and I can see that person and I can hear that person. Now, sometimes people do have hallucinations where, where, where they have insight that somehow it's probably not real. But when we talk about a classic hallucination, the person who is having that experience believes that uh, whatever they're experiencing has an existence outside their mind. And of course, as we talked about uh, before, Julian James theory was that up until about 3000 years ago, people on a regular basis, anytime they had to make an important decision or felt a lot of stress would have an hallucination, usually of God's ancestors, perhaps their parents. And what happened over time, that form of mentation, that, that, that sort of command communication control system uh, was inadequate for social complexity. And then people had to culturally develop consciousness. But hallucinations never really went away, in a sense. And I say that for two reasons. The first reason is that we can still experience a type of watered down hallucination with mental imagery, or even what, what is called auditory imagery. If we close our eyes, we can try and listen to the voice of a good friend or a parent or a spouse. Um, and of course, we can, quote, see things with our mind's eye. Those are not full-blown hallucinations, but I think they are the descendants of full-blown hallucinations experienced thousands of years ago. So mental imagery, it, uh, it, it's a, um, well, let me back up. Uh, another key difference with mental imagery is that we have voluntary control over our mental images, usually, which is different with hallucinations. Of course, there was no control over hallucinations in ancient times. So that's a very important point to keep in mind, the connection between uh, full-blown hallucinations and mental imagery. In a sense, they're the same thing. Not exactly. I call mental imagery uh, semi-hallucinations. So that's the first thing uh, about hallucinations. The, the, the next thing is that many people today experience hallucinations and they do not suffer from any sort of psychopathology. Unfortunately, the word hallucination in English has ne negative connotations. It's associated with mental illness, mental disorder. And often hallucinations do accompany things like schizophrenia or if someone is under tremendous stress. But there's a lot of research out there that shows that, that ordinary people from time to time, we'll have hallucinations. Um, I myself, two or three times in my life, clearly had a hallucination, nothing dramatic. And I'm sure if we took a poll and asked a lot of people, they would uh, acknowledge that once or twice in their life, they also heard a voice of someone uh, who wasn't there. So there's, in a sense, there's nothing unusual about hallucinations. And what does this have to do with uh, Jamesian psychotherapy? Well, uh, actually, Jane's. Uh, let me interrupt for a second. Sure. I want to spend a little bit more time on this. Sure. Um, 
the way I'm approaching this is in terms of faculties, you know, human faculties that we have, and then how did they operate over different cultural eras? So we clearly have the faculty of imagination where we can project a mental image. Um, we have the faculty of memory. We remember a lot about our senses and we can recall that. And that's kind of real to us as a, as a mental image. So it is kind of, we have the memory, we have imagination. In imagination, we can do combinations and manipulations of those images to have a mental object in our conscious interiority. And that is a faculty that we use all the time for mm -hmm. doing all kinds of things. That's so that's an integral part of the this it's a it's a human faculty which is critical for us. Right. Now um, it looks like you know now when we compare the bicameral era with the modern era, the same faculty which is operative because Jaynes holds that there is no evolutionary difference between these two. It's cultural difference. Right. So what has happened is that we have achieved a conscious mastery over our imagination faculty. And we are using it deliberately to simulate possibilities and to, to explore the possibility space. Mm -hmm. uh, in the modern times. In the past, when we did not have conscious interiority, we still had the faculty of imagination and it was being used. And at that time, those people were used to following traditions, following the, um, the advice of their parents or their gods or their kings or their ancestors. So they kind of infused, they use that faculty almost subconsciously or unconsciously to have the image of their father come and say, do this, or image of Athena come and do this. So it looks like it's the same faculty, which is being used in two different cultural contexts. Mm -hmm. um, am I kind of on the right track? I, I, I think so. Yeah. So it, the, the, the issue has to do with the words we're using. Um, so for example, I would uh, deny that uh, bicameral people experience mental imagery. However, you can certainly say that they had imagination because they still needed mental representations. They needed concepts and conceptualizations in order to do all the amazing things that they did. It's just that the language they used did not give them access to what we would call this simulated mind space. Wonderful. That, that's a great, great clarification. It is very difficult to talk across different mentalities and right. try to see what is, you know, try to name what is going on with a good enough uh, and, uh, you know, precise enough terminology. So I always appreciate when, 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 when you do these corrections, really appreciate that. Um, okay, so that's hallucinations. Um, shall we go to, uh, sorry, you, you were saying something about uh, how these are used, the connection between this and uh, Jane's uh, psychotherapy. Right. So somewhere very briefly, Jane's did say, I understand that many people who are not suffering from mental illness experience hallucinations. They don't necessarily enjoy these hallucinations, but if they were taught that actually that experience of hallucinations is just a vestige of an earlier mentality, perhaps it would put a lot of people at ease. And in fact, there is a lot of research uh, and there, there are also some movements <clears throat> on what are called voice hearers, people who do not suffer from psychopathology, but have hallucinations that they find a bit disturbing and they want to get to the bottom of it. And there's actually uh, uh, a therapy that's been developed for people like that in order to teach them that actually when they have an hallucination, don't worry about it too much. It's just a part of yourself that needs to be integrated um, into your larger personality. So again, um, th there is a practical aspect to understanding 
the role of hallucinations. Excellent. Uh, shall we go to hypnosis next? Okay, sure. Uh, so hypnosis is one of these very interesting phenomenon because there's actually a tremendous amount of research done on hypnosis. It's used in therapeutic settings with hyp hypnotherapy. It's been used uh, in therapy for many, many years. But the issue with hallucination, or excuse me, with hypnosis is that we don't, there's no real good theory on it. There are many candidates. There's a, there's a lot of research, but nothing really explains well, I think, why people are able to be hypnotized. And of course, some people can be hypnotized better than others. However, James has a whole chapter in his book on hypnosis, and he explains why hypnosis is possible. And if you stop and think about it, hypnosis is a very odd phenomenon, because when you go under, you have this sense that you're not in control anymore. Of course, you really are. If, you know, you, there's a lot of myths about hypnosis that people can uh, control you and tell you to walk off a bridge against your will, things like that. Um, that's, that's not true. But never, nevertheless, there's a lot of misunderstanding about hypnosis. And really, it was only Jane's who came up with an explanation that fit together hypnosis with consciousness. And uh, in my, th this book that I'm working on now about self-healing, of course, I go into more uh, detail on exactly what goes on uh, with hypnosis. So, um, it, you know, there, there are many things I could say about hypnosis, but maybe I'll, I'll stop there if, if um, you want to ask a specific question um, about the nature of, of hypnosis. Sure. Um, so based on Jane's ideas, when hypnosis hypnosis is going on what actually is going on so now i understand that there may be different phenomena that people may be kind of referring by the same name so what 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 happens in hypnosis uh, as per james theory james theory so to put it simply hypnosis is almost a return to uh, the vi uh, to the bicameral mind sort of a vestige of the bicameral mind because what's notice, what's significant about hypnosis is people will obey verbal commands in the same way they obeyed uh, auditory hallucinations. So there's an important connection there. And basically, according to James, what happens during the hypnotic trance is that the different features of conscious interiority are shut off. Mm -hmm. Because consciousness, remember, is just a cultural layer over... Uh, a more fundamental type of mentality. So it's almost as if the bicameral mentality is our default mind. And so if you can strip away the beliefs we have about imaginary space and self narrativization and things like that, if you can push them to the side and temporarily shut them off, then hypno then you can hypnotize a person. So that, 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 that's a simple explanation of what happens. Very interesting. Very interesting. So it is, um, I mean, I'm just trying to think of this just like we did with, um, in, with the previous concept. Uh, I'm trying to ask myself, you know, what is the natural, what are the natural faculties uh, and how do they operate and how do they connect to this phenomena of hypnosis? So it looks like you have like system one and system two, system one kind of automated mm -hmm. functioning and system two kind of governing that. So what you're saying is that in hypnosis, system two is not operative or the conscious interiority is not operative. Right, it's suspended. Right, and instead of hallucination, so, it, it, so in this sense, it looks like the hallucination and hypnosis is similar is that in both cases, the um, conscious interiority is not operative. Is that correct? Well, it, 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 it depends. I mean, with hypnosis, excuse me, with hallucinations, you can still be conscious, conscious. and okay. ha hallucinate. Um, however, with hypnosis, you won't be uh, right. co conscious as ordinarily defined. Right. So what is happening is that it's kind of bicameral. It's that, that's so, so in that sense, 
hypnosis is the most direct example of bicameral mentality today. What it, yeah, so hypnosis, it's almost as, as if what it would be like to be a bicameral individual. Of course, we can never completely be a bicameral individual because we're so socialized mm -hmm. and enculturated with the features of consciousness. We can never get them out of our mind, right? Mm -hmm. But if we had to come up with an exercise to see what would it be like to listen to the voices of the gods, hypnosis is the, uh, the, your best bet. Um, because as I said, a key feature of hypnosis is that people respond automatically to verbal commands. Uh, like I said, I want to emphasize that doesn't mean they, they'll do whatever you tell them, of course, but they actually change their perception of reality uh, when, uh, when they're hypnotized. So something fundamental is going on there. But I want to make a general point here uh, because this is a general pattern. This is a distinction between system one and system two. And people routinely uh, underestimate how much of our behavior is system one or how much of mm -hmm. our behavior is kind of almost automatic, almost kind of reactive. The consciousness, the conscious interiority in Jane's terms or system two, which is called slow thinking by Daniel Kahneman, which is full of effort or William James term for will, what he calls he, he says will is paying attention to difficult objects. So the act of paying attention when you don't want to pay attention, uh, that act, all of those are effort intensive, culturally learned ways of regulating our automatic response system. So it is, they are at a higher level than the automatic uh, operation. And it is that level that allows you to go beyond your current, current programming. Uh, and it is precisely for that, you know, precisely when the programming the bike of the bicameral mind did not really uh, was a match for the surroundings that kicking and screaming that this conscious interiority developed. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that distinction is huge of this kind of effort intensive because people kind of say people, and what has happened is that even the words have been polluted by this mixing up. So people are, don't make a clear distinction between conscious interiority and let's say feeling something mm -hmm. like yes. So they, they kind of, you know, term consciousness spans across fundamentally different kinds of things. And by doing so, you're not able to pay attention and to separate out and pay attention to the most um, valuable or what Jane's calls our cultural greatest cultural heritage. We are not able to separate that out from from the rest. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I think it's a, a one good way to describe conscious interiority is quasi perception, which is different from physical perception. Because in the laboratory, we can study perception very easily. Uh, we know what perception is about how the different senses work, how it relates to our neurology. But quasi perception, the experience of imaginary space in my head, we don't really have a way yet in the laboratory to study exactly what's going on there. So that, that's why I think an easy distinction is quasi perception versus physical perception. Wonderful. Would you like to say anything more about hypnosis before we go to meditation? Sure. So an important thing about uh, hypnosis within the context of therapy, as we all know, uh, for many people, hypnosis is a way to get rid of a bad habit, or perhaps to look at a problem from a different angle. And the way that is done is through suggestion. And basically what hypnosis does is hypnosis quiets your uncertainties and your doubts and all these voices that we have in our head screaming at us. Um, it shuts those voices off and it allows a part of our, another part of ourself to 
take in the suggestion, to be open to the suggestion. And so this is where other features of consciousness become important to understand. So for example, self-authorization, we talked about that last week. So what hypnosis does, it shuts off the self-authorization and it allows another person or maybe another part of herself to take over the authorization that we, that we trust. And that's why hypnosis doesn't work unless you trust the other person. Um, so the, the whole issue here is one of suggestibility and how suggestibility can be used in hypnosis in order to uh, help people. Wonderful. All right. So now let's go to the topic of meditation. And that's where we would like to, I would like to spend most of the time because I think this is of great interest to, to everybody here. Uh, we, we have done more than 20 meetups on meditation. Um, so yes, Brian. So what, what do you think about meditation? So uh, James actually didn't talk about meditation, um, but I think it's something that has to be addressed in any account of the nature of consciousness, because all these things, hallucinations, ordinary conscious interiority, hypnosis, meditation, we have to remember they're all cut from the same mental fabric. They do different things, they're different phenomena, but if we understand one, we can understand the other. So what's important about uh, meditation is, uh, well, just let me just begin by saying the first time I meditated, this is many, many years ago, um, I, it, it was a very a frustrating, very disturbing experience because basically you're asked not to think you're, you're asked to sit still. Uh, and I had a very hard time at first because I could see how my, I was not in, in control of my mind and I'm not sure what the experience has been for other people when they try to meditate. Um, but it was a very humbling experience. It really taught me that I am not master of my, my, my mental domain, that something else is, you might say. And for me, it was sort of like, eventually I felt like I was on a raft out in a stormy sea, just being buffeted by the waves and the wind and, and this fear of, of drowning. So it was a real eye opener. And it took me a while, of course, to figure out what meditation is and, and how to meditate. Uh, and then of course, more recently, um, seeing how it works in a therapeutic context. So what the only, only thing I'll say about meditation, I, 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 uh, I think probably this is the easiest way to do it because it connects to the, the features of, uh, of uh, consciousness is that, and I think many people know this, there are two types of uh, meditation. And the first type is, what we can call concentrative or focused attention. And the idea is to sit still, close your eyes, pick a mantra uh, or pick something that uh, inside your mind, an image, or it could be something external, some sort of uh, perceptual uh, item and focus on that and see what happens. So that, that's the first type of uh, meditation. The second type of meditation is what some people call mindfulness, mindfulness meditation. And the idea here, and I think this is more difficult for people, this second type of meditation, is to allow the excerpts. And if you remember, that's a feature of consciousness, the excerpts of, of our mind, sort of like a, a stream that has different things on it flowing before our mind to allow them to just float by without grabbing on to uh, any of them without obsessing about them. Uh, it, I mean, it's impossible to tell someone to stop thinking, right? It's, it's impossible to tell someone to stop thinking about thinking. And, but basically that's not exactly what you're trying to do, but you're going in, in that direction with, uh, mindfulness uh, meditation. You're just allowing your mind to reveal itself. And of course, uh, for those of you who have meditated or familiar with meditation, you know that if you do that in a regular practice, um, it does seem to have a lot of, uh, not just uh, psychological, but also a lot of physical benefits. So, you know, maybe I'll, I'll stop there on meditation. Um, but what, what 
I, I just add one final thing. As I said before, the way I look at it is we can understand what meditation is, what's happening with meditation if we apply a Jamesian interpretation of conscious interiority. And I, I should, just one more point. So meditation is not, uh, it's not trancing. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're hypnotized, you're, you undergo a trance. Meditation is not shutting off consciousness. Meditation is allowing consciousness to work. It's just that you're trying to get, put yourself in control of what's going on. Because in the literature lately, there's a lot of confusion. A lot of people put hypnosis and meditation together as if they're the same thing or somehow related, but actually they're very different um, mental processes. Okay. Um, now I'm very familiar with meditation, you know, thanks to the fact that I grew up in India and that's a very, it's a very age old practice there been done, you know, for, for thousands of years. Um, I mean, I think with those that distinction is important, the, the uh, mindfulness meditation versus concentration meditation, that's a very big difference. Um, so let's start with mindfulness meditation. So mindfulness meditation, and what, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to relate it to this conscious interiority. So mindfulness meditation is to maintain your conscious interiority and you're noticing things that are coming in. You're not reacting to it. So, but you're noticing things that are coming in and you're just letting them flow through. Um, that's how I, I experience mindfulness meditation, or that's how I see mindfulness meditation. Uh, Brian, is that a fair way? Uh, Brian, you don't need to respond to anything in chat. Uh, Brian, can you hear me? Uh, uh, Brian, oh, oh, you're cutting out. Okay, I think maybe it's, uh, uh, folks, can you hear me? Are you? Oh, okay. Everybody else can hear. So it's probably at your end, Brian. Uh, Brian, can you say something? Uh, yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Okay. I perfect. think it was, uh, I think it was my speaker. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's so a, let me repeat. Yeah. Let me repeat. Um, so what I'm saying is that let me try to now talk about meditation. I have some background in meditation. Uh, thanks to me coming from India. Um, so let's start with mindfulness meditation. For mindfulness meditation, I certainly think that you're using conscious interiority. You're very much aware of what is, you're noticing things that are coming into your conscious interiority, your mind, mental space. And you're not reacting to them. You're trying not to do anything with them and you're just experiencing them. So it's definitely an exercise in holding the conscious interiority. Yes. That's how I see the mindfulness. Is that a fair way of describing it? Yes, absolutely. So as I said before, um, what I've seen in the literature, sometimes people have a sort of a mystical view of what meditation is, but I think it's important, as you said, that uh, meditation is a type of consciousness. Uh, in fact, I think you might say it's a, it's a way of honing or sharpening um, the features of conscious interiority. It's a way of cultivating consciousness. Very good. Um, now let's talk briefly about the concentration meditation. In concentration meditation, also you are maintaining your conscious interiority, but you are directing your attention to a particular object, whether it be an actual physical object in front of you, an image in your mind, or a sound that you're producing yourself or hearing. So you're aware and you are trying to direct your attention on one particular thing as opposed to everything else. Is that a fair way of describing the concentration meditation? Sure. Okay. So what does meditation do for us? Um, yeah, I, I, 
Well, there are so many things it does. Um, I, I think at the most general level, for me personally, as I said before, it shows me that my I, as a future of conscious interiority, is really, in many ways, very weak. It's very powerless compared to what else is going on inside my mind. Um, and of course, meditation, uh, it, there are so many therapeutic benefits of meditation. Um, and I'm sure we're aware that many people have um, used meditation to deal with all, all types of, not just emotional, but physical disabilities, physical problems. Um, and I'm not uh, exactly sh sure, I'm not exactly, it's not exactly clear to me how or why meditation does those things, but uh, clearly it's a benefit. Wonderful. The, the good thing is that many people in the audience have a lot of experience with meditation. So I'm going to look forward to uh, folks uh, just relating this experience. We'll try to explicate the nature of meditation using Jane's ideas right now. And then after the breakout rooms, you know, please talk about, you know, talk about all these three things, whichever ones you find more interesting. You don't have to talk about hallucinations or hypnosis if you don't want to. I know that everybody will want to talk about meditation to some extent because it is in a far larger part of our culture than the other two. Um, but, uh, and then when you come back, you can talk about our takeaways uh, as, well as, uh, as well as questions. Um, so let me see. Um, so it, I mean, this is a huge topic, uh, meditation, I, I agree. With you, I mean, one thing I would say is that it gives you the distance from whatever is going on. So yeah. instead of being focused on being on reacting to whatever is going on around you or in you, it allows you to see that you have this conscious interiority that give you know, and you have an analog eye which separates you out from having to react to any particular thing. So it's kind of like the, there is a stoic practice of um, view from above. So it's kind of equivalent of that, where you're kind of imagining seeing yourself from above. It's very similar to that. Um, so it, it gives you perspective. It gives you, um, it breaks the cycle because we, we tend to kind of get into cycles of all kinds, emotional cycles, mental cycles, which are unproductive. It allows you to rise above these cycles or at least notice that you're doing it because otherwise you do not even notice that you're doing it. It also provides a way of uh, switching, switching out of a given context. Suppose you have had a bad day you do meditation and it puts you in a completely different mental um, mental state. So it's, I think switching of context is another thing that it does. The uh, another, other thing I see, I, I think it's just amazing. Uh, the other part of it is to be kind of aware of your body or aware of what is going on because otherwise you don't, you kind of go about your life unaware of many things. It allows you to focus attention um, and to be, to be aware of what is going on. So it re increases your awareness. And so basic techniques of body awareness of things like paying attention to your breathing may sound so simple, but they are so profound and have so such a deep impact on you in such a short time. So it's almost magical of what, what that can do. So, um, so those are some of my thoughts about you know, what medit meditation does. Uh, would you like to say anything more about meditation? Sure, I, just a few things. Um, just to sort of step back a bit historically. So it's not a coincidence that, to the best of my knowledge, there are no records of meditation 
before maybe 7th, 8th century BCE. And the reason why is because you can't meditate if you're pre-conscious. Uh, so that, that's the, the, the first point. Uh, so something else, you know, I first encountered meditation, maybe I was very young in the late 1960s, late, uh, early 1970s. And at that time, in, at least in the United States, you know, I mean, some people were aware of um, uh, spiritual exercises imported from uh, uh, Asia, South Asia, but um, it was still considered a little bit odd. And so I'm very happy to see as I've gotten older, over the years that uh, the medical establishment has adopted something that uh, of course has a very old lineage and is very useful. Um, and uh, all, just one more point about uh, meditation. So meditation can cultivate certain issues or certain features of conscious interiority that need cultivating, but also, and Sher Kant seemed to say this, meditation can also control certain features that get out of hand. So we talked about this last week when we have runaway consciousness or we have a, a thought loop that goes around and around. That loop is being driven, that dynamic is being driven by certain features of consciousness. And, and so meditation gives us the opportunity to check in and find out what exactly, why is my eye behaving the way it is? Mm -hmm. Why am I ruminating on something um, so much? So in any case, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, th those are important points, I think. Wonderful. Um, all right. Uh, let, me, let me think. Um, so folks, what we are going to do is we are going to now go to breakout rooms. So to, now we are doing this entire series on Julian Jaynes. So you're welcome, you know, in the breakout rooms do focus on these topics that we have discussed, but when you come back for your takeaways and questions, anything about Julian James is fair game, okay? So I encourage you to ask because the, the concept really that we're trying to communicate is the concept of conscious interiority. Because if you get that, you get almost everything about Julian James and then you can, build everything step by step yourself if you want. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions about any of the ideas of Julian Jaynes uh, when you come back. All right, so I'm starting the breakout rooms now. They will run for 20 minutes and we'll be back in 20 minutes to continue the conversation. So it's gonna be Stefan, Judy, and David. Stefan. Hi. Um, so, Brian, is is meditation the practice of um, exercising the bicameral mind? Brian, you need to unmute yourself. So the simple answer to that is no. Um, meditation is not a way to engage the bicameral mind. Uh, meditation very much is implicated and involved with conscious interiority. And so, of course, if you have a lot of conscious interiority, you're not going to have uh, much uh, bicameral mentality. Excellent. Uh, next up is Judy, followed by David. Judy. Okay. Um, we talk, You talked about meditation, and we have it in our practice. Um, this may be ignorant, but is there a practice where we can use hypnosis and hallucination on ourselves without um, drugs, for example? Um, yes, uh, you don't have to use drugs at all, actually. Uh, but so, I don't know. Okay, so with, um, with hypnosis, there is something called auto-hypnosis or auto-suggestion. And remember, in order to be hypnotized, you have to allow yourself to enter a certain mental state. You have to trust the hypnotizer. But basically, when anytime we're hypnotized, we are the one that is hypnotizing ourselves, strictly speaking. Um, does that answer your uh, question? What about hallucination? Halluc can we produce our own hallucinations in part of our practice? 
Yes, you. Yes, in fact, uh, in the session I was just in, somebody asked about um, how to cause hallucinations. So you don't need drugs to cause hallucinations. Uh, the easiest way to do it is to uh, go to a place where they have a, a, a sensory deprivation tank, oh. where you uh, have your senses shut off, and that seems to shut down certain neural circuitries. And for some reason that leads to uh, hallucinations. And that could be dangerous also. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I actually have not tried it. I don't know much about it myself, but. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be David, Dave and Govert. Yeah, hi, Brian. Yeah. This, you know, thanks very much. I mean, for all of these sessions, very, very interesting information. Uh, I mean, I have a question, you know, Try, try not to be, I mean, don't take this as argumentative, I mean, or against, I mean, about, you know, James. What I'm trying to understand is this, you know, concept, as you mentioned, hallucinations, the bicameral mind, and clearly there's been a change. But was there any thought, you know, by you and by James that, that, that we still are hallucinating? It's simply, or I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to sort of put, how to say, that, that we're still hallucinating, but we have rationalized it, we're interpreting it in a different way. In other words, that that we now, we just think instead of having this sort of visual, um, you know, hallucination that, that that's realistic to us, that we're still getting these this information fed to us, we're just interpreting it as, oh, I thought of that myself, or that was my creativity, or that was, I was inspired to do that. And it's, it's and we've just trained ourselves in the modern world to look at this flow of information to rationalize it differently, but the flow is still there. Mm -hmm. is, is there any thought from James or from you about that as a as a interpret a different interpretation? Again, not to be argumentative that it's this sure. wrong to be you know. No. No, that's um that, that's a good question. So there are two ways to answer it, I think. So one way is that in terms of hallucinations, as I said before, I believe mental imagery is a type of hallucination. It's a type of, uh, it's not exactly full-blown hallucination because mental imagery is not as vivid as a real hallucination and we have voluntary control over it. So at, at that at that sort of basic level, yes, I, I think that we still are having hallucinations. Um, but I think you seem to be talking about um, perhaps, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, hallucinations from the perspective of uh, ideology and how in any culture we are socialized, we are brought up, we are enculturated to accept certain beliefs. And that, of course, is an ideological uh, issue. And I think in a general way, yes, I think we are living in a type of uh, hallucination. Well, what I was saying is that, that, that we continue to be in, have inspiration. And that maybe, I mean, I'm just asking whether there, there's a thought that, 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 what, that we're interpreting hallucination from 5,000 years ago or what, what, was, what was characterized as hallucination 5,000 years ago. Maybe it was more vivid then, but we're still getting these messages from the other side of the brain and we're simply d interpreting them or describing them differently or we're able to filter them out and ascribe them to a different source. In other words, that historically in, you know, you know, Iliad, obviously, I mean, that there, were the, there was the same information, but that we were describing it in a certain way it was, and that we're getting the same information now, but we're simply saying, oh, that was in from inspiration. That was from me, myself. We aren't, we aren't separating it out as a separate entity or as the gods inspiring us. I mean, you have people writing music and they say, you know, oh, it just came to be, you know, and you know, as opposed to, oh, a muse gave it to me. I mean, we're, we're using different words, but it's the same concept. Has there been a thought about that? Well, I, I think in a, in a certain, from a certain perspective, I think that is true. I mean, instead of having the gods inspire us or command us, now we're having the analog I or myself inspire me. But where does that inspiration come from? Certainly, if uh, people who are creative often have the experience that is coming not from them, um, 
you know, where ultimately does it come from? I, that's a philosophical question I can't really answer. But I do think it's uh, important to keep in mind that um, there is no absolute objectivity. When we try to figure out where does my inspiration come from or where does my, how am I having these mental images? Uh, what is consciousness? Um, to be a little bit non-scientific, I, 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 I doubt that there is something that, that, that is uh, absolute objectivity. That's just my opinion. Um, so I, again, I don't know if that answers your question or uh, is even in this, the, the, the ballpark of, of what you're talking about. But um, uh, let, me, let me go ahead and um, try, try to answer. I think one of the key things that Julian James is saying is that this is a cultural issue not evolutionary issue. So basically the same things that were happening over there in terms of potential back in the bicameral days in terms of our same things that can happen now. Um, one of the best examples of that is what the Center for Study of Digital Art, uh, Digital Life keeps talking about of the oral culture. So we are talking about the bicameral mind is an oral culture. TV is like the reincarnation of the oral culture. So just like at that time, you would be swimming in all these stories and myths. We are swimming in similar stories and myths, and we are reacting in a similar way to that. Now, we do have the capacity of, consciously, uh, of conscious interiority but that is not being used much when people are watching TV mm -hmm. and we are operating kind of at the bicameral level at during that time, we are kind of, we are kind of, you know, the, the, it's not the Kings. It's not the gods. It's Seinfeld, you know, uh, you know, but what I'm saying is that the same kind of phenomena keeps repeating that it, it remains there. Um, and the, question that you're asking is a very interesting question of saying, how do you distinguish between exactly what is going on in your mind? And there you have to be very careful about introspection of what actually you're doing. And we have tremendous capacity of fooling ourselves about what we are doing and the extent to which we are conscious. Um, and many people think that they are very conscious when they're watching, watching TV, but they're not that different. Uh, maybe they're not that different. So, so absolutely, this is a very good point. Mm -hmm. it, the ability of responding to stories remains the same and something similar is happening, but we retain the capacity of doing that because we have kind of learned it, but, the, but it requires effort to engage that. And to the extent to which we engage that is a variable. Um, next up is going to be Dave, followed by Dave, Govert, Rebecca, Kimberly, Judith, Joe, and Jyoti. Dave. Thanks, Rikant, and a very interesting presentation, Brian. Thank Just you. reflection on hypnotism, uh, and this may be a little bit off track, but I just remember like 50 years ago when I was young, uh, people would be on TV doing hypnotism entertaining I, i'm thinking you know very similar to a magician it's because it seemed like they had magical powers and i remember specifically they have they have two chairs you know about five feet apart or whatever and have somebody lay down if they were hypnotized and put them on the, these two chair backs like one uh your shoulder blades on one chair and your ankles on another chair and you look at that and say wow he's given that person superhuman strength because it looks almost impossible, but you try it yourself, it's fairly easy. It doesn't take any strength at all to do that. But, uh, but I understand, um, and I think my point is, and I think you made it, that really hypnotism just allows you to do things you could do anyway, but may overcome uh, your own personal anxiety or something like that. Is that. I think that's what you're saying, right? Yes, that's pretty much exactly what I think hypnosis is. It, allow, it gives you a type of confidence, a, a self-confidence, that ordinarily you would not have. Um, so yes, and, and, but sometimes we need that extra boost of self-confidence. For example, if we're trying to stop smoking or some other uh, bad habit, um, 
hypnosis allows us to quiet those doubting voices in our head and uh, encourage us to do what we should do. Next up is Govert, Rebecca, and Kimberly. Govert. Um, yeah, Brian, thank you again for, for engaging us. Uh, it is pretty interesting and uh, very thought provoking. So I was wondering uh, what you think of the following two editions of modes of um, meditation that doesn't have to do with interiority. One is meditations that trigger the bicameral mind. Um, you know, since the 70s, there's all this uh, uh, phenomena of uh, channeling and, 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 you know, getting in contact with your higher self. And I think that's kind of a triggering of the bicameral mind to, to you know, get direction if you don't know anymore what to do in your life and you go into so-called meditation and you try to trigger, you know, <laughs> the other part of your brain to tell you what to do. So that is one variation. The other one, how about a, a meditation that totally deconstructs interiority, that goes beyond and overcomes interiority? And, and here, you know, I'm very uh, fascinated by this uh, Indian teacher, uh, Srikant probably knows about him, Bidu Krishnamurti, whom I think is one of the most perceptive, uh, analytically uh, uh, incisive deconstructors of Jainian consciousness, of, of interiority. So the, these are two ways of meditation that, that kind of uh, break out of the, uh, the Jains consciousness, one going backwards and the other one possibly going towards in a, uh, a different kind of mentality that might be our future mentality. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. That's uh, very interesting. So I, I mean, the way I look at it in terms of deconstructing conscious interiority, that's what hypnosis is. That's basically what hypnosis is doing. And of course, hypnosis is very different from meditation. And strictly speaking, uh, meditation does not have much to do with the bicameral mind. Meditation is very much wrapped up in conscious interiority. Um, I suppose it's possible to put yourself into some sort of meditative, what broadly understood was a meditative state that led to a type of uh, channeling or some, some sort of a triggering of a bicameral experience. But as I said, strictly speaking, um, uh, meditation has to do with uh, conscious interiority. Uh, uh, does that answer? Uh, I mean, that, that's how I look at it. Does that uh, clarify me, things for you? Let, let me go ahead and answer uh, as well. Um, so I would say, firstly, in the first case, I think meditation is just a wrong word to use for it, because what you're trying to do is more closer to hypnosis. You're trying to put yourself kind of under consciousness, and you're explicitly trying to kind of uh, use something which is not conscious. Um, and so for me, meditation is there. And Jiddu Krishnamurti, I'm, it's been a long time since I've read him, but I don't think it has anything to do with going away from conscious, um, conscious interiority. Um, so, but these are kind of at the edge of the topic, but uh, Govert, you want to do a very quick, uh, quick response? Uh, sure, I, I, I can imagine, you know, the, the, the reactivation of the bicameral mind to be then a hybrid between meditation and bicamerality. So there is a, 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 a portion of interiority, but there is also this, this kind of controlled reactivation of, of inner voices. Uh, as far as Krishnamurti is concerned, I, I really do think he is going beyond uh, James. Because nobody is familiar with Krishnamurti, there is no point talking about it. The people will not <laughs> will be talking about something that nobody knows has any reference whatsoever. So. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's going to be uh, Rebecca and Kimberly. But uh, go over to your point about kind of combination. I just object to the term meditation, but uh, it's, you know, kind of being conscious of voices is certainly something that is there within the parameters of 
uh, kind of imagination. It's kind of like playing out imagination. So somewhere around there, but it's, it's, it's just a question of uh, the words that are being used here. Um, next up is Rebecca followed by Kimberly. Rebecca. Yeah, um, my interest in this lies a lot around um, when we get into deep states of meditation and we're trying to kind of cut off external senses. Um, is this, um, is the stuff coming into our minds, is it being created from within or is this us tapping into some type of external messaging? Um, and we talked about this a little bit in our breakout room. And then um, when we mentioned sensory deprivation is where light bulbs really went off for me. And I, I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that and how that actually leads to hallucinations, because I'm just thinking, you know, we're so inundated with our, you know, our senses are constantly being stimulated. Um, but when we cut those off, you know, is this us creating or is this us listening, I guess, if that makes sense? Okay. Well, um, I'm not sure if, if uh, it, it, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. Uh, uh, but I, I would say that there is something to sensory deprivation because the mind is so used to working on the senses. And when you unplug the senses, the mind resorts to, to some pretty bizarre things like creating hallucinations. Now, I'm not sure if that taps into something external. And as we talked in the in the end of, in the uh, the breakout session, um, you know, that's kind of a more of a philosophical, almost spiritual way of looking at things. Th 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 this idea of t tapping into something external. It's, it's possible, I don't know, but the science, as I said before, the scientific part of me says we should just focus on individual minds um, uh, from a scientific perspective. And probably when you do experience sensory deprivation and you do hallucinate, those hallucinations are being constructed by your mind. So let me add, uh, add something to this. Uh, we did an entire series on mindfulness meditation and it was led by Taylor, who has done this Vipassana meditation. She has been to these Vipassana camps. These are 10-day camps uh, for many, many times, almost over a dozen times. And she spent a lot of time describing the experience of these camps. Because what you're doing is that, as uh, Rebecca, you were saying, normally you are inundated by all kinds of sensory input. And you are doing a whole bunch of things in reaction to that. Suddenly you are sitting, okay, eating very basic food and sitting most of the time and meditating. So you have basically cut out your phone, your TV, your people around you. All of that is gone, okay? Now, what happens in that sense, uh, in, in that case? So one of the things that happens is that you suddenly become aware of what is going on more. It is, you are able to step away because, not because it is such a special occasion, but because it is very different from what we were, what you are used to. And you start noticing things that you would not otherwise notice because that ability to notice would be covered up by the reactions you would normally be having to other things. So there is definitely an experience of experiencing something that you did not experience before. Um, and a lot of it is inside, but there can be a lot of things around you in the sense that simple physical awareness of the birds and the, you know, and the wind is something that you can have. So it's like, it's being aware of different things. So it's a powerful experience of um, improving your conscious interiority because you are suddenly changing what was playing out in that conscious interiority. You're also 
removing a whole bunch of reactions, habitual inputs and outputs. So it's a very powerful experience. And I see it as being completely, um, you know, uh, it's very easy to see this in terms of just common sense of these ideas of com conscious interiority, reduction of habitual things. And the experience that people, uh, you know, I've had several people who have done these 10 day sittings and they are thrilled with it. First, they talk about it being very difficult up to a point because you are letting go of some things that you are basically addicted to really. <laughs> And you are, and that is very hard. And you are kind of sitting there, and then you are a little bit bored. But then slowly, once that chattering kind of and complaining quietens down, you become aware of different things. And that's what the experience is. It improves conscious interiority. Rebecca, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Um, I do still think about, um, someone mentioned it before, people who are musical geniuses or um, are born with certain artistic capacities that they don't even think it just, it's something coming, that, you know, I don't know where I got that idea, it just came to me. So I still, you know, I question, I guess my question is more towards when we shut out those senses that that sensory perception are we tapping into additional senses that we may have um okay. that understand um, a world that can't be seen by our five senses but yeah that was very helpful i want to go to one of those things sure um so let me respond to to this last point uh the thing is that our unconscious or our subconscious is very large our brains are enormously large and our ability to take in and see patterns at non-explicit level is quite large. And all of that is actually a humongous part of human experience. And most people, most artists are not consciously aware of the great things. So for example, <clears throat> let's take the example of music, right? You listen to music, you produce music year after year after year. You're building up these massive conglomeration of patterns. And all of those are going to come to you when you're trying to sing. And that's just natural. That's the part of our large brain that we have. So even when it is happening at a unconscious level, it is something, something you know, magnificent. So it's just showing that we have a large brain and we are able to do a lot with it, even underneath the conscious. So our, another way of putting it in terms of uh, Kahneman, our system one is very powerful. System two rides on the top of it. Um, we are focusing on the operation of system two. So the phenomena of saying, it just comes to me, that's basically what you have, that has been put in over a long period of time and you can't really, and it has been all kind of, the patterns have been built on it and you don't know exactly how those patterns came. but. That's, that's what the uh, base of it is. Uh, next up is uh, Kimberly. I'm unmuted. So my question has to do with hallucinations. So is visual dreaming a form of hallucinations? Because 80% of the time I have very high visual dreaming and I usually remember it all the time. So you're, you're asking if, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't hear exactly, vi visual dreaming? Yes, uh, she, she's asking whether visual dreaming is kind of hallucination. Well, strictly speaking, it's not a hallucination. It's certainly hallucinatory. We can use that adjective because dreams, by definition, are, of course, um, odd piece of information put together and they deliver a very surrealistic hallucinatory uh, 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 atmosphere, we might say. But the reason why I would say that they're not hallucinations is because uh, when we when we when we dream we're asleep and strictly speaking in order to have an hallucination you have to be not sleeping you have to be awake now there may be something else going on you know i suppose there's a lot, a lot of research on lucid dreaming and perhaps 
if you are a lucid dreamer, perhaps you can hallucinate. I mean, anything's possible, but um, that pr what, what I just said probably makes things a bit more complicated. But in any case, uh, th th that, that would be my answer. Next up is Judith, Joe, and Jyoti. Judith. Um, oh, geez. Okay, so well, just about the dreaming, I, I just read this article in Nature that said that when, you, when you're... Um, at night, well, your brain has the capacity to take over information, um, you know, to use it for a different capacity. It's so plastic that, that the way we maintain our vision at night when we sleep and our eyes are closed and we have no input for, you know, so many hours, um, the brain has to hold that territory. And so what it does is fills um, that area of your brain with images. But that was just something I read in Nature Magazine two days ago. Um, so my question is, um, I'm really stuck with this um, this in, in conscious interiority space in the brain, mind, wherever that um, culturally, what um, you know, evolved. Um, and before that time, okay, it seems like what you're saying is that like we're passively following voices if we're living it with a bicameral mind, um, but active planning, rearranging ideas in our interiority, wouldn't that's evidence, I, the way I understand the way you're saying is that, that active planning and manipulating ideas and images in that interior, in conscious interiority space is um, new and culturally evolved in the last, you know, last thousand years, thousands of years. Before that, people planned, they planned how they would hunt, um, so I just have difficulty understanding series it didn't exist and only voices existed. That's a question I'm just still working to get through um, for the last several weeks actually. And then I wanted to know if there's any value in bypassing that conscious interiority. Like we put a large um, value judgment it seems on system two, but maybe system one serves us in some really powerful ways. Um, that we need to also be attentive about and you know i don't know just a thought okay um good uh thank you very much for those uh questions the so uh, your, your first question um i'm glad you asked it so yes people who were pre-conscious and bicameral times could plan they did plan of course there's tremendous archaeological evidence of that however when people became conscious, when they learned to become conscious, they planned better. They planned more efficiently. They planned quicker. They could plan uh, long-term in a way that pre-conscious people could not plan. And so it's not a matter of whether people could, could plan or not. It's a matter that they were, that they, uh, conscious interiority gives us or strengthens, we might say, our planning ability. So that that's a I, that's a good um, question because it, uh, it gives me the opportunity to uh, clarify uh, that point. Uh, and then your second question about bypassing conscious interiority. So that's very important. Uh, that basically that's what hypnosis tries to do. It tries to bypass or suspend, and then you might say bypass conscious interiority. And a lot of counseling, a lot of psychotherapy actually is about getting in touch with non-conscious issues, with non-conscious processes that are clouding our judgment and causing us some sort of mental distress. And of course, anytime you engage non-conscious processes, you're bypassing conscious interiority. Conscious interiority gives us a lot of benefits but too much of it, when it starts to run away, actually, it causes a lot of problems. It's sort of like having a really sophisticated computer program. It does all types of things for us. But if it's too sophisticated, chances are it's going to break down. Like new cars these days, right? With all the, you know, when I was young, the first car I had did not have a computer in it. Now cars have computers in it. Now they, there seems to be more problems with them. So in any case, uh, I hope that clarifies uh, your questions. So I, I have two comments. Uh, one is, um, you know, we're going to have Marlene Donald come next Sunday at 5 p.m. 
And he talks about three stages of cultures. One is a mimetic culture or imitative culture. Second is a mythic culture, which is an oral culture. And then third is theoretic culture, which is supported by external memory. Now, I agree with uh, Brian that planning happens at all these levels, all three levels, but the, it happens in a different way. And the power and the range of it, complexity of it varies. For example, chimpanzees hunt and they hunt pretty well and it requires some amount of planning, but all of it is learned imitatively. You know, monkey see, monkey do. But that again, even chimpanzees, their brain is quite large and they're able to do fairly complex maneuvers in order to hunt. Uh, and it's, our brain is much larger than chimpanzees. So even at a pure imitative level, we are able to do more. Now add to that speech, you can go another level. But when you add writing, when you're talking about directing a city of 5,000 people in order to over period of 20 years or five years or a whole year, that's a completely different ball game. And the kind of planning that is needed for 5,000 people over a year, over a large geography that you can't see, for that, the kind of planning, you know, you, you will need a lot more. So as, as we progress in technology, uh, the scale of planning uh, keeps going up. Uh, next, and uh, last point about the, um, the value placed on conscious interiority or system two. Um, you know, the thing is system one does most of the things. Uh, the point of building a habit is to use your conscious interiority so that you don't need to use your conscious interiority anymore. It becomes kind of part of your reactive system or your system, system one. So definitely, you know, you want, it's like elephant and the rider. You want the elephant to do as much as possible, but the rider keeps watch to make sure that it is doing the right things and keeps on upgrading the elephant as, as you go along. Um, next up is Joe, Jyoti and Rob. Joe. In a way, actually, uh, I just have a question that was uh, similar to Judas and uh, Dave's. That was just a combination of the two, and it was the. But it, it was the idea of this uh, of hypnosis, and how you're actually trying to essentially are you just tricking yourself because you're bypassing the uh, uh, conscious interiority into a habit? Is that a way of thinking about it? And then now you have your system one and you're automatically reacting and you're getting rid of that habit. Is that the way I'm thinking about it? And if that is the case, is this just a, a one-time thing that you just do it once and then you can all, you know, that the mind automatically starts to pick up or do you have to reoccurringly go into hypnosis and reinforce it almost like a meditation, like, um, like regularly, like meditation seems to be, more of an organic process where you develop the habit and you actually just, you know, you change on a, with a routine. Whereas is hypnosis just a, uh, a way of just fooling your, your system one. And if so, how many times do you need to do it? How often do you need to do it? Things like that. Yes. I, I think that's not a bad way to put it. That hypnosis is about tricking your mind it, as we said before, it's about temporarily shutting down consciousness. And then you revert to a more, in a sense, a more fundamental mentality, which is system one. And it's very important to keep in mind that most mentation, most psychological processes are system one. Consciousness is an illusion. Consciousness only occupies a very, very small part of our daily lives. And uh, there's been a lot, a lot of research to show that throughout the day, we are usually not conscious. We, we, we usually shut down consciousness. So there's nothing really unusual about hypnosis in, in a way. Um, and so the, to get back to, to the other part of your question about is being hypnotized to unlearn a bad habit, a one-time thing, it really depends on what the habit is. There are many variables. Um, probably 
uh, it, it's not going to happen just once. Uh, it, it's possible, I suppose, but there are so many, in, in especially in the counseling session, there are so many um, uh, variables that determine how many times you're going to need hypnosis to uh, deactivate uh, a bad habit. And really quickly, can I ask a quick follow up to that? Is the idea, does it, it the plasticity of the brain, where the, actually you're able to, does the hypnosis work with the plasticity? Like, or is it because it's seen to work with, uh, with mindfulness meditation? Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I think what meditation and what hypnosis show us actually is how plastic the mind is, uh, how easy it is to change our minds. Um, if we are put into a certain mental state where we trust ourselves or we trust a hypnotizer. Um, so uh, yes, and, and you mentioned mindfulness. And of course, um, all these things are, are related, especially in, in the case of meditation. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, so much work, so much research now on the usefulness of uh, mindfulness. Uh, thank you. Next up is Jyoti, Rob, and Stefan. Jyoti. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Um, my question is going to be at a very personal level because I have been meditating from past 20 years. Um, I And I don't know whether you would call this med a meditation because my first part of my meditation is pranayama. I don't know if you know about it. It's a controlled breathing. It's focused, it's concentrated, and I'm tracking the breath, which is coming from my body parts to my uh, upper level, and then it's uh, you know exhaled, and then I'm going back. So that is a process that I think I'm very much in tune with myself, but only in the area of breathing. Next part is, and I will say that it might be conscious interiority because when we were, and I'm, I know Shrikant knows about it, when we were younger, our parents used to take us to the mandir, it's a temple where there are a lot of deities there. And the, the idea was, at least that's what my family had said, you respect the deities, you get the energy from the deities. So the deities, you look at them and they are, they're in the mental space. They're like um, Shikan says, there's a, a stimulus, then there's a response, and then there is a in between a mental space where nothing is happening, but your images are in storage. You are not reacting to them. And that's my external cues. Those deities are my external cues. I have the pictures of all those deities in my gallery wall that I was showing it to my breakup room, uh, Ganesha, Shiva, Lakshmi, and what have you. Then I have the mental images of them in my mental space and I'm breathing and I'm breathing through in that mental space. So I don't know if you would call that meditation that I have been calling a meditation for a very, very long time. And it, that gives me an energy that anchors me up. And then when I get up from there, I'm very calm. And I also see the, the Lakshmi is floating on the lotus in the water. I live by the water. And I see the Lakshmi is you know, floating and there are a lot of lotuses around it and I'm seeing the water come and go. So these are all my visual cues, but they are all in the mental space. So how would you, def would you define that as a hallucination? Sure, uh, <laughs> or, Brian, <laughs> Brian, can I answer this first? Yeah, sure, please. Go ahead. Okay, sure. so these are two different kinds of meditation that we talked about. Right. Uh, the first one is the mindfulness meditation, and the second one is the concentration meditation. When you're doing pranayama, you are actually paying attention to your breath. Right. You're doing something with your breath and you're paying attention to your breath. So there, that is the form, that form of meditation is the mindfulness meditation. You're just paying attention. The second kind of meditation, when you're using deities, you are, it's the concentration meditation. So you are focusing your attention on 
one, in this case, a visual object, and then on the image of that visual object. So you're using, so these are the two kinds of meditation that Brian talked about. Brian, uh, any, any further comments? Well, just very briefly. So if I understood you correctly, you would actually uh, have a mental image of the deity in your head. And so you asked, is that a type of hallucination? And my answer would be, it's not a full-blown hallucination, but it is a semi-hallucination. It is a type of hallucination because you have power over it. Um, so in any case, um, that, that's basically the only thing I would, would say to that. All right, uh, next up is Rob. Rob, go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, it's been interesting. Um, so I had uh, an observation and a question. Um, first observation has to do with uh, people were talking or somebody was talking about hallucinations still persisting. Um, I guess as a remnant of the bicameral mind breakdown. I I'm not sure, but anyways, my. I remember uh, I've heard voices a couple of times in my life. Uh, first time I think it was a haunted house kind of thing. Um, so I don't know if I, I'm not going to go into that. Next time was walking into a uh, supermarket and um, this is some distance in time between the two of them. I heard voices uh, from that appeared to be whispers or something coming from around me. And they, these voices would tell me about the people around me and uh, what they were you know, what they're all about and what they want to do and stuff like that. Um, and my, my observation at the time was that um, I, I felt that I, those voices had always been there, but I just hadn't noticed them before. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I wonder if uh, maybe that's the case, that uh, these voices are always there, uh, but we just don't notice them. We don't hear them. Um, okay. Thank you. That was an observation. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, you can comment on that for sure. I'd love no, to. No, go, go ahead and ask the question. Then we'll comment on everything. Yeah. And the question is um, like, I remember one time doing some, some kind of meditation. It was about uh, control. And uh, I remember that, um, well, there's some things that happened and uh, uh, things changed. Um, I remember in the meditation, I noticed. For example, I remember in the meditation, I noticed myself laughing. I hadn't noticed it before. And uh, then I felt myself being squirted through a small channel or whatever to another place. And, uh, and then stuff happened. But I might, the thing is that the next morning I woke up and I couldn't read anymore. Uh, it took me about a week to rediscover how to read. Um, so my question has to do with um, um, the way that the, the split mind processes things. And I remember reading in the James book about you know, people have had that, uh, that connection between the brain severed and um, one side of the brain can hear things but not talk and the other side of the brain can both hear and talk. Um, and I wonder, I don't remember seeing anything there about reading. Can both sides of the brain read and they both write when you have those kind of patients where they're, they've had that cord, that, that channel snipped? Got it. Process visual information like reading and writing differently. That's the question. Thank you. Um, actually, I don't know. I, I would, uh, I would suspect that you can, even though you have that, uh, operation where they sever the, the, the two hemispheres. Um, I, I can't really answer it, uh, definitively because it's, it's a neurological question. And I do know that certain types of information that have to do with language, reading, writing, articulation, of course, are stored in different parts of the brain. Um, but, uh, to get, to go back to your observation, I, I, you know, I think you made an important point. You asked if we always do hear hallucinations, but we're not aware of it. I, I think that's how you uh, put it. And my thought on that is actually, there's a continuum between full blown hallucination, which is very, very rare these days. And then on the other side of the continuum, inner thoughts. And there's a lot of gray area between a full-blown hallucination, mental imagery, and just thoughts. And I think that um, uh, many of us are, just seem to be a little more sensitive to registering 
our inner thoughts as hallucination. So again, that that's uh, a little bit vague, but um, I, uh, that that's that that's uh, just my comment on your observation. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next up is going to be Mike. Mike, go ahead. Um, hi. Um, uh, I use the term excerpting. Excerpting is a way way of discriminating uh, the gift we got three thousand years ago. Um, and uh, I view that, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but I view that as the ability to practice my golf swing and without moving a muscle. And instead of practicing uh, with a ball and a club, uh, which takes maybe five minutes to line up, uh, or minutes to line up a thing, I could practice 700 swings in, in a couple of seconds. Now, I wonder if that's the kind of planning that, um, uh, that, that occurs. And I wonder to what extent uh, a, a lion chasing its prey uh, does something like that. I've heard of tests where, they, uh, where a mouse runs a maze and uh, with, wire, with wiring uh, to his head. And uh, you hear the thing going grip, 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 grip as he uh, hits the walls and uh, memorizes the maze. But then uh, when the lion is off duty, when the mouse is off duty, occasionally you hear those same rip, 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 rips uh, going at, uh, at, uh, uh, at 20 times the speed. And I just wonder, uh, you mentioned that this is a, a question of degree. Have you seen some evidence that says our entire bicameral mind and consciousness is a question of degree like that? Uh, similarly, uh, writer's block uh, might take me three pages, uh, three pages a day to do, do something, to create a presentation, or to solve a problem. But uh, in in my uh, in my mind, uh, uh, rehearsing, I can put out 200 pages, uh, the whole report in uh, uh, in, in 20 minutes. Uh, I won't remember. I don't remember it when I wake up, but uh, often. But sometimes I do. Any comments about any of those things? <laughs> well, that's a that's a lot um, you brought up, and let me try to go back. Well, in terms of a mental block, I think we've all uh, experienced that, and uh, you, you know, mental block mental blocks occur. I think when we have too many voices in our head, and we're forcing ourselves to do something, and if we figure out a way to shut off some of those voices and to turn down the volume on certain features of conscious interiority. Uh, in other words, to just relax, um, I, at least in my experience, I find that writer's block uh, clears up pretty quickly. Um, to get back to what you're saying about, I, I wasn't really clear on the connection with the mouse. Um, uh, uh, the, let, let me take that, uh, Brian. Sure. So, um, so, one, one, so there are many phenomena happening at the same time. So one part is the, phenomena of memory. I mean, all of us, all mammals have significant brains and we have capability of remembering something. So, and so for example, when the mouse is running something or running a maze, or you are learning to go through a certain path, you remember those things. And that, you know, that's kind of part of you. And when you think of those things or those things occur to you, through some uh, kind of connection, some kind of similar uh, stimulus, those same, same memories can be triggered. And all of that is happening under conscious, you know, that's not consciousness, that is remembering. And there is a lot of remembering that is going on, whether with a mouse and especially with human beings, all skills are like that. And those are not conscious part. The, conscious part would sit on the top of such phenomena of saying, what would happen if I went there? And instead of that, what would happen if I went there? You're you know, working out multiple paths and multiple possible paths. Uh, so it kind of rests on the memory mechanism mm -hmm. and does a lot more uh, with that. All right, folks. So this is this has been fantastic. Um, the questions are great, and you are uh, everybody is covering the entire gamut of ideas of uh, Julian Jane. So we're very delighted. 
Uh, so uh, next time, uh, 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 Brian, can I talk to you a little bit here? Uh, sure. Just I just want to talk it out. If we can figure something out right away, we can do that. Otherwise, we can do it over uh, things. I think we should continue the series on this book itself. And uh, you talked about the nature of, of the self. That would be a great topic. Do you think we can do it next uh, next Saturday? Sure. Okay. Okay. So yeah. next Saturday, uh, folks, uh, next Saturday at 12 o'clock, we will be discussing further part of this book. Um, and the topic is going to be the nature of the self. Okay. It's a very deep topic, a very interesting topic. And I'll provide some some kind of more description of it in the meetup over the next couple of days. But uh, please mark your calendars for next Saturday at 12 o'clock. And Brian, thank you so much. I oh, think thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well. Uh, these people keep coming back and their kind of knowledge. See, that's what I like, Brian, about these meetups. It builds up common knowledge, you know, common concepts. So it allows us to discuss wider and wider range of phenomena so that we can talk to each other. So for example, we talked about the dif difference between mindfulness, meditation, and concentration. Jyoti could just talk about her experience and we could use the same concepts to communicate. So hopefully something got communicated to somebody else here. Yes, yes. The common concepts, but that is only because we've been working very systematically on identifying these concepts. So there is just tremendous kind of communication that happens not only of the ideas we are speaking, but it increases ability of people to talk to each other uh, about, about our conscious experience. So I think that's, that's what we are accomplishing here. Yes. So uh, folks, thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Thank you.